proceed on assassination. Do you read the manual now? No, but I, I know enough about the report that uh, has been made to some of the members in the, in the uh, intelligence committees in the, in the Congress. And uh, no, it, there was nothing in that manual to talk to assassination at all. Will you release that report when it gets to you, even if it's before the election? Sure. Why not? I think it's but sir, it said neutralize, didn't it? Isn't that what? the same thing? What? Didn't the manual say neutralize? And that can't that be construed as meaning assassinations? Mm -hmm. I suppose you could construe it any number of agenda, uh, several ways, but in the context in which it was recommended, actually that was not the choice of the original choice of the word. The real word was remove, meaning remove from office. If you came into a village or town, remove from office. Uh, representatives of the Sandinista government, when they translated it. Spanish, they translated it neutral, neutralize instead of uh, remove. But uh, the meaning is still remains well, the same. Mr. President, how did doing that without uh, violence and force? No, you just say that the fellow that's sitting there in the office, you're not in the office anymore. <laughs> Mr. President, how did you feel when the Soviets implied that we had something to do with Indira Gandhi's assassination? I think it was probably the world's biggest cheap shot in a long, long time. They know better, of course. And I think to take advantage, I know that li human life doesn't mean much to them, but to take advantage of a tragedy of this kind, to try and gain some political advantage, it was a cheap shot. Is that why Schultz is not meeting with the deputy minister over there? I, I don't know that. Did you uh, convey this word to the Soviets? But they have been told that uh, we don't like it.
guys! Hey guys! Hey guys! at some other joint. <laughs> First thing I learned at Mother's Knee Vice is at some other joint. <laughs> oh, personally, he wants to move that.
Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'm a dessert mind myself, but <laughs> I suppose it's really better for me that I didn't get to finish it, but it's delicious. Well, it's very good to be in Milwaukee, and it's a joy to be able to visit this Wesley Park, Wellesley Park retirement home. Nancy and I thank you for inviting us, and I would like to formally say hello to all of you, octogenarians, nongenarians, and um, of course the kids, my fellow septuagenarians. <laughs> Did I get that right? I don't say those words very often, <laughs> and I tend to mispronounce them because I don't think in those terms. I've, I think I've just seen the things that you've made at the Christmas Bazaar, and I can see that your attitude toward life is similar to the fellow who said that, and this was pretty good advice, old age is 15 years from where I am now. <laughs> you remember the great baseball pitcher, Satchel Paige? He once asked, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you was? <laughs> well, think about it, I did, that's why I've I've been 39 for the last 34 years. <laughs> but one of them is something that I think has been the, some things I want to speak about just briefly, and one of them I think is the most disturbing part of the election campaign. The eagerness of some for political purposes to demagogue on the issue actually of social security. And it really leaves me steaming when they try to portray that some of us are having some plans in which secretly we're going to do something about depriving people who are dependent on that particular program. When we came into office, the problem was Social Security was facing bankruptcy. And we tried to get a bipartisan program together to salvage the program. And after the 1982 election, uh, finally they agreed when we had to borrow $17 billion to, uh, so the checks wouldn't bounce. And I feel that the people in Social Security contributed all their lives to that program, invested, uh, entrusted their money to the government, and now I want to make one thing plain, and I have hoped to be able to talk to my contemporaries about this and say this, and that is, there is no secret plan to do anything about depriving people who are dependent on Social Security, and there never will be as far as I have anything to say about it. Those who are dependent on this program are going to be able to depend on it, and we have now had that bipartisan get-together, and the program is sound fiscally for as far as we can see into the future, into the next century. Now there's another thing I want to talk about for just a second here. Most of us have had children, and, and uh, one way and help bring them up one way or another, give them support and encouragement, and teaching them. And now in traveling over the country in these past few months, and when I was governor of California, there was, seemed to be a different era of the young people then than there is now. I think you'd like to know if you had the opportunity, be on a campus or see them, Today's young people are just the most wonderful young people that I can ever remember seeing. They're filled with patriotism and a love of country. They're serious about their lives and they're uh, wanting an opportunity and to get ahead. And it's just a magnificent thing to see. And you'd all be, be very proud. Now, I mentioned that other time when I was governor I also would like to talk for just a moment about us and our generation. While I was governor, that was in the era when I was being hung on a number of campuses in effigy, and they were burning flags and the school buildings down and so forth. But one day, I got a demand from some student officers on the University of California, nine campuses, a demand to see me. Well, if I went near the campus, I started a riot, so I was delighted. Well, they came in in the uniform of the day, most of them barefoot, torn t-shirts, blue jeans, 
slouched into some chairs, and then one of them as the spokesman started in. And he said, uh, Governor, it's impossible for you to understand our generation. Well, I tried to pass it off, uh, something that we all know. I said, well, we know more about being young than we do about being old. And he said, no, I'm serious. He said, you can't understand your own sons and daughters. You didn't grow up in an era in which there was instant electronic communications, computers figuring in seconds what it used to take people months and even years to figure, jet travel, space journeys, out to the moon and so forth. Well, he went on just long enough. Usually, you know, the answer comes to you after you've gone home and you say, I wish I'd said this. Well, he talked just long enough that the Lord blessed me with the answer and when he paused for breath, I interrupted him because I'd been thinking about something all the time he was saying these things. And I said, you're absolutely right. We didn't have these things when we were your age. We invented them. It sure did change the subject <laughs> in, a, in a hurry. But um, I just, uh, now I want to say one more thing just about us. And some of it came from that particular dissertation and thinking of that answer. There have only been a few generations in all history in which a single generation presided over a great transition period. The young people of today are going to see things that we probably can't even imagine. They're going to see mar many marvels and wonders. They will never see, however, the transition that we saw that in our single lifetime, we went from the horse and buggy to landing men on the moon, to space travel, to all of this. And uh, I can still remember the phones that you cranked to get the operator and say, number please. And now they don't even have cords on them, if, if you want to get one of that kind. But anything, whatever it's named. And so I think that we have nothing to apologize for. Those people who want to say, well, the people that went ahead of us, they didn't leave this or that for us. I think this generation of ours, we can sit back and smile easily because I've been saying to some people out on the road, I don't think anyone has ever done more to give dignity and freedom to our fellow man than we have in this our single lifetime. So I think we have much to be proud of. And uh, it's good to be here, and it's good to see all of you, and whatever happens on Tuesday, uh, it's been a great honor to serve the fast past four years as your president, and it's something that I will treasure all my life, and I thank you for that. So I won't take any more of your time now, but thank you again for letting us be here with you. and. Uh, I'll tell you, and you'll all understand this too, dear friend of ours, George Burns. You know George, and he's still going, and he's making another movie in which this time he's going to play God and the devil. But George has not only been a dear friend all my life, but he has become a great hero to me. He calls me kid. <clears throat> Thank you all very much.
should say, and I'm Wisconsin. You know that's the song, the fight song of the university. America pushed back our frontiers and built strong and thrive. Lovely mural here behind me. Remind question in the remark. Just just listen and see if it doesn't get answered. And then, you know, yes, yes. I, but we see this new hope speaking about his appreciation of America. But I've come to ask for your finest who are helping us build a better American future. And one of the bright stars in the United States Senate is not running. He's your own Bob Caston. Yeah. And I know that Bob agrees with me that we would say Jim Sensen brings some company back there. So. Sounding the call just before we took office. He said of our economic program, it is obviously murderously inflation from above 12 down to around 4%. And that was right before the United States economy created more than 6 million new jobs in 21 months. Any control of oil prices would cost you 36. <laughs> on my own constituents. Doesn't that make you just want to be one of his constituents? <laughs> <laughs> this year he's outdone himself. He's already voted 1,800. <laughs> that prorates out to about a 12. <laughs> his economic plan has two basic parts. Two. First one, raise your taxes. Second part, do it again. <laughs> I've got a for him. The American people don't want his tax increases and they're not going to get them. I don't care. got hidden behind the curtain. <laughs> if it were a Broadway play, it would be promises, promises. <laughs> And if it were a book, you would have to read it from the back to the front to get a happy ending. <laughs> and I'm proud to say that during these last four years, on another subject, not one square inch of territory any place in the world was lost to communist aggression. <laughs> stood for one and damned the other. Yeah. In this country, when we have rallies of this kind, I know that in this country there are... Yes. Last medical experiments that have been started already, and they're encouraging and lead us to believe that we can, up there, the United States Senate, he called it that it was a, a, a horrible waste. Well, we... <laughs> We've been going on too long here. Sending out SOS and started saying USA. America was never meant to 
be a second best nation, like our Olympic athletes, and our local governors, and a committee in the House of Representatives for more than two years under the direction of Tim O'Neill, and that's why we want these candidates and these congressmen of yours returned to Washington so that we can get them to simple thing, vote, and make sure your neighbors vote. Get everyone out. USA! Hands high! USA! Hands high! USA! Americans! As a Serbian Drusla, it is a symbol of, of Serbian symbol of liberty, and she gives it to you as to the champion of liberty and the free world.